Thank you so much, Mr. President, and NDTV, for this great distinction. Who you are cannot be isolated from where you come from, Malcolm Gladwell said in his book The Outliers. I moved to the United States 35 years ago and may have had wonderful success in that meritocracy. But none of it would have been possible if I hadn't had such a lovely upbringing in India. As a result, I owe India a great debt of gratitude. Now I'd want to share my three lessons with you. First and foremost, please consider yourself a lifelong learner. When we're young, we ask questions like, why is the sky blue, or why is the bird soaring so high? But, for some reason, as we get older, our curiosity fades, and if we're content with what we know, we'll atrophy. So, please keep your curiosity alive by becoming a lifelong student. Second, whatever you do, put all you have into it, your intellect, heart, and hands. I don't think of my job as a job, I think of it as a calling, a passion, and I don't mind the long hours or the difficulty since everything is a delight to me. So, whatever you do, consider it a vocation and a passion rather than a job or something transient. The third and most crucial point is to assist others in rising. Greatness comes from contributing to the future, not from holding a position. All of us in positions of power owe it to others to help them rise. As I stand here today, I see my obligations not as an honor, I see them as a task, a responsibility, and an obligation to really make it possible for those who are younger to get to the level of greatness so that they, too, might be on the platform at some point in the future. Thank you, NDTV, for this tremendous honor, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and NDTV, for this great distinction. Who you are cannot be isolated from where you come from, Malcolm Gladwell said in his book The Outliers. I moved to the United States 35 years ago and may have had wonderful success in that meritocracy. But none of it would have been possible if I hadn't had such a lovely upbringing in India. As a result, I owe India a great debt of gratitude. Now I'd want to share my three lessons with you. First and foremost, please consider yourself a lifelong learner. When we're young, we ask questions like, why is the sky blue, or why is the bird soaring so high? But, for some reason, as we get older, our curiosity fades, and if we're content with what we know, we'll atrophy. So, please keep your curiosity alive by becoming a lifelong student. Second, whatever you do, put all you have into it, your intellect, heart, and hands. I don't think of my job as a job, I think of it as a calling, a passion, and I don't mind the long hours or the difficulty since everything is a delight to me. So, whatever you do, consider it a vocation and a passion rather than a job or something transient. The third and most crucial point is to assist others in rising. Greatness comes from contributing to the future, not from holding a position. All of us in positions of power owe it to others to help them rise. As I stand here today, I see my obligations not as an honor, I see them as a task, a responsibility, and an obligation to really make it possible for those who are younger to get to the level of greatness so that they, too, might be on the platform at some point in the future. Thank you, NDTV, for this tremendous honor, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's nearly hard these days not to incorporate photography in a history of art lesson. I disagree with people like Walter Benjamin who claim that technology and an air incompatible. With its realism and exact portrayal of what is in front of you, photography deprived many artists of their subject matter at first, pushing them to look in new ways, which was not a terrible thing. True, mass-produced reproductions of the Mona Lisa, for example, cannot replicate the sensation of seeing the original artwork. There are, on the other hand, images that, in my opinion, are considerably more thought-provoking and emotive than a painting of the same topic. Some argue that the traditional notion of an artist with a skilled hand and eye is antiquated. 
They no longer feel that an artist needs specialized expertise and can just aim a camera at a place and film it. On the one hand, this overlooks the creative skill required to create images. On the other hand, it overlooks the reality that artists have always employed a variety of technical tools. Vermeer, a Dutch painter, for example, employed a camera obscura to assist him in creating his works. We'll get to that later, but for now, Jay wants to focus on photography's documentary and cultural importance. It's nearly hard these days not to incorporate photography in a history of art lesson. I disagree with people like Walter Benjamin who claim that technology and an air incompatible. With its realism and exact portrayal of what is in front of you, photography deprived many artists of their subject matter at first, pushing them to look in new ways, which was not a terrible thing. True, mass-produced reproductions of the Mona Lisa, for example, cannot replicate the sensation of seeing the original artwork. There are, on the other hand, images that, in my opinion, are considerably more thought-provoking and emotive than a painting of the same topic. Some argue that the traditional notion of an artist with a skilled hand and eye is antiquated. They no longer feel that an artist needs specialized expertise and can just aim a camera at a place and film it. On the one hand, this overlooks the creative skill required to create images. On the other hand, it overlooks the reality that artists have always employed a variety of technical tools. Vermeer, a Dutch painter, for example, employed a camera obscura to assist him in creating his works. We'll get to that later, but for now, Jay wants to focus on photography's documentary and cultural importance. Fire safety products are tested and certified by BSI, which has more than 40 years of unequaled experience and a renowned reputation in the field. A wide range of items, including as fire extinguishers, hoses, alarm panels, and heat and smoke detectors, are tested and certified by our team in Hemel Hempstead using the BSI Kite Mark and the C. By ensuring that products fit all of the C Mark standards, we assist customers in entering the European market. In addition, we are well versed in the rules of most nations throughout the world, making it easier for our customers to enter new markets. Since its inception, BSI kites have been regarded as a signal of confidence, reliability, and superiority all across the world. Product safety and performance standards have been satisfied by means of this certification. Our staff puts each product through a series of testing and production control audits to make sure it meets all of the needed safety and quality requirements. Fire detection and fire alarm system components are tested for compatibility and connectivity to guarantee that they are compatible and interoperable. The European regulatory body's increased demand for national installation instructions is met by this service. Detection components are also put through their paces as part of our testing process. Products like fire extinguishers are submitted to rigorous testing meant to verify that they're both effective and safe in the areas in which they're kept and utilized. Both the BSI Kite Mark and the C certification reflect the highest standards of product reliability, quality control, and public confidence. Specifiers might see this as a sign of their dedication to using best practices in the procurement process. Furthermore, they provide the public the confidence that fire safety products are safe and effective.
Fire safety products are tested and certified by BSI, which has more than 40 years of unequaled experience and a renowned reputation in the field. A wide range of items, including as fire extinguishers, hoses, alarm panels, and heat and smoke detectors, are tested and certified by our team in Hemel Hempstead using the BSI Kite Mark and the C. By ensuring that products fit all of the C Mark standards, we assist customers in entering the European market. In addition, we are well versed in the rules of most nations throughout the world, making it easier for our customers to enter new markets. Since its inception, BSI kites have been regarded as a signal of confidence, reliability, and superiority all across the world. Product safety and performance standards have been satisfied by means of this certification. Our staff puts each product through a series of testing and production control audits to make sure it meets all of the needed safety and quality requirements. Fire detection and fire alarm system components are tested for compatibility and connectivity to guarantee that they are compatible and interoperable. The European regulatory body's increased demand for national installation instructions is met by this service. Detection components are also put through their paces as part of our testing process. Products like fire extinguishers are submitted to rigorous testing meant to verify that they're both effective and safe in the areas in which they're kept and utilized. Both the BSI Kite Mark and the C certification reflect the highest standards of product reliability, quality control, and public confidence. Specifiers might see this as a sign of their dedication to using best practices in the procurement process. Furthermore, they provide the public the confidence that fire safety products are safe and effective. We're all terrified at some point in our lives. Seeing a spider, hearing a loud noise, or hearing a creak in the floorboards at night might cause us to get frightened. Fear may cause your heart to accelerate, your breath to speed, you to scream, your eyes to dilate, you to freeze in place, and even cause you to urinate uncontrollably. All of these stress reactions are a result of a cascade of brain activity in the limbic system, which coordinates the body's natural fight or flight response. We've got something built within us to assist us respond to and withstand any potential threats. We wouldn't be here today if it weren't for fear. Many individuals appreciate the thrill of being afraid and the rush of adrenaline that comes with it. Going on a roller coaster, watching terrifying movies, or playing scary games are all ways to get your heart racing. During a stressful situation, our bodies generate hormones that are comparable to those released when we are ecstatic or delighted. It's considered that if we do it in a safe atmosphere, we'll get a kick out of being afraid and the rush of stress hormones coursing through our veins. We're all terrified at some point in our lives. Seeing a spider, hearing a loud noise, or hearing a creak in the floorboards at night might cause us to get frightened. Fear may cause your heart to accelerate, your breath to speed, you to scream, your eyes to dilate, you to freeze in place, and even cause you to urinate uncontrollably. All of these stress reactions are a result of a cascade of brain activity in the limbic system, which coordinates the body's natural fight or flight response. We've got something built within us to assist us respond to and withstand any potential threats. We wouldn't be here today if it weren't for fear. Many individuals appreciate the thrill of being afraid and the rush of adrenaline that comes with it. Going on a roller coaster, watching terrifying movies, or playing scary games are all ways to get your heart racing. During a stressful situation, our bodies generate hormones that are comparable to those released when we are ecstatic or delighted. It's considered that if we do it in a safe atmosphere, we'll get a kick out of being afraid and the rush of stress hormones coursing through our veins. From 1469 until 1527, Machiavelli was alive. The Prince, Machiavelli's best-known work, was dubbed a gangster's playbook by philosopher Bertrand Russell. 
I believe that if we look at it in the context of its time period, which was Italy and particularly Florence, rather than as a generalization, we may better understand its original intent. A better understanding of Machiavelli's rationale for creating the treatise will be possible in the 15 feet 11 and 15 feet 16 centuries. There were many city-states in the Italy of that time period, and they were regularly at conflict with one another. It was a tense and dangerous situation, especially when other countries, particularly France, became involved. Machiavelli was very protective of Florence, the city he grew up in, and would do anything to keep it that way. To this end, a Florentine army loyal to the city-state of Florence might be formed. Many years of Machiavelli's life were devoted to this question. It's important to keep in mind that he was also an active member of his community, politically engaged, and a Florence-born ambassador. By meeting and seeing some of the most powerful people at the time, as well as observing them, he learned to grasp the nature of power and how to keep it. The prince was a way for the prince to impart the teachings he had learned to Florence. From 1469 until 1527, Machiavelli was alive. The Prince, Machiavelli's best-known work, was dubbed a gangster's playbook by philosopher Bertrand Russell. I believe that if we look at it in the context of its time period, which was Italy and particularly Florence, rather than as a generalization, we may better understand its original intent. A better understanding of Machiavelli's rationale for creating the treatise will be possible in the 15 feet 11 and 15 feet 16 centuries. There were many city-states in the Italy of that time period, and they were regularly at conflict with one another. It was a tense and dangerous situation, especially when other countries, particularly France, became involved. Machiavelli was very protective of Florence, the city he grew up in, and would do anything to keep it that way. To this end, a Florentine army loyal to the city-state of Florence might be formed. Many years of Machiavelli's life were devoted to this question. It's important to keep in mind that he was also an active member of his community, politically engaged, and a Florence-born ambassador. By meeting and seeing some of the most powerful people at the time, as well as observing them, he learned to grasp the nature of power and how to keep it. The prince was a way for the prince to impart the teachings he had learned to Florence. Playful snarls from another dog are mimicked when this dog approaches food. Despite the dog's curiosity, it doesn't seem to be put off by the sound of the bone. Despite hearing the growls of another dog being approached by a stranger, this one nevertheless grabs the bone. Playing the sound of a dog guarding its meal back in another circumstance, a dog's bark is heard. After another round of growling, the dog finally backs off. Dogs appear to be able to differentiate between different sorts of growls, according to these studies. Playful snarls from another dog are mimicked when this dog approaches food. Despite the dog's curiosity, it doesn't seem to be put off by the sound of the bone. Despite hearing the growls of another dog being approached by a stranger, this one nevertheless grabs the bone. 
Playing the sound of a dog guarding its meal back in another circumstance, a dog's bark is heard. After another round of growling, the dog finally backs off. Dogs appear to be able to differentiate between different sorts of growls, according to these studies. Every so often, a civilization is born. We might be able to find stars where civilizations could flourish if we go through the data. Every year, how many new stars emerge? Seven, but there are some stars that are too cold and some that are too hot for life to exist on Earth at this time. Only about a quarter of them are up to snuff. For species and animals to survive and reproduce, there are a number of criteria, including environmental conditions, temperature, tolerance ranges and body size, weight and nutrition. Seasonal and daily activity, behavior, and altitude are all important. A shift in the environment necessitates the migration of animals, and only those that can adapt to the new conditions may live and reproduce. One of the only organisms that uses technology extensively to push the boundaries of its natural tolerance range is the human. Every so often, a civilization is born. We might be able to find stars where civilizations could flourish if we go through the data. Every year, how many new stars emerge? Seven, but there are some stars that are too cold and some that are too hot for life to exist on Earth at this time. Only about a quarter of them are up to snuff. For species and animals to survive and reproduce, there are a number of criteria, including environmental conditions, temperature, tolerance ranges and body size, weight and nutrition. Seasonal and daily activity, behavior, and altitude are all important. A shift in the environment necessitates the migration of animals, and only those that can adapt to the new conditions may live and reproduce. One of the only organisms that uses technology extensively to push the boundaries of its natural tolerance range is the human. Until the advent of new medications people diagnosed with schizophrenia occupied one half of the hospital beds in the United States, one out of every 10,000 people come down with schizophrenia and 750,000 are treated every year, several million people in the United States currently have had this disorder at one time or another in their lifetime, although we think of schizophrenia, as a mental disorder, for lifetime risk of this illness is the same, as for diabetes which causes is, unless the one hears a lot more about, and for which a lot more research and treatment development, the peak age onset in somewhat different for men and women men usually began to have difficulties, in their late teens or early twenties, as women tend to begin to have this illness, in their middle twenties or even into their thirties.
Until the advent of new medications people diagnosed with schizophrenia occupied one half of the hospital beds in the United States, one out of every 10,000 people come down with schizophrenia and 750,000 are treated every year, several million people in the United States currently have had this disorder at one time or another in their lifetime, although we think of schizophrenia, as a mental disorder, for lifetime risk of this illness is the same, as for diabetes which causes is, unless the one hears a lot more about, and for which a lot more research and treatment development, the peak age onset in somewhat different for men and women men usually began to have difficulties, in their late teens or early twenties, as women tend to begin to have this illness, in their middle twenties or even into their thirties. Licking and grooming, nipple swapping, and archback nursing are all methods used by a mother rat to care for her offspring. It's the rats that spend a lot of time licking themselves and grooming themselves that reign. However, most rats fall somewhere in the middle. There are mothers who are overbearing and mothers who don't give a damn, and the majority of mothers fall somewhere in the between. Look at these rats, for example. As a result, all you have to do is keep tabs on them and split them into cages. Because the high lickers are not the mothers but the offspring and the low lickers are in a separate cage, you can see that the high lickers have a lot of glucocorticoid receptor gene expression in their brains, but this isn't the only difference. As time went on, we discovered that hundreds of genes had variable levels of expression. So, if a mutation occurs, you'll be aware of polymorphism, which occurs around once in a million. With just a single injection from the mother, hundreds of genes are launched, and the modifications they produce are so consistent that you can examine an elderly rat and tell whether it was licked or not. But you may also save money by changing your habits. You can tell which rats were badly lighted by looking at their behavior, the frightened, difficult to maneuver ones act like puppies, while the well-managed ones act like kittens. They have a lot more laid-back disposition, which makes them much simpler to manage. When a rat is being licked by an adult, it's important to look at how it was licked when it was a bit tough. Mechanism. What's going on here, and how does it all work? Licking and grooming, nipple swapping, and archback nursing are all methods used by a mother rat to care for her offspring. It's the rats that spend a lot of time licking themselves and grooming themselves that reign. However, most rats fall somewhere in the middle. There are mothers who are overbearing and mothers who don't give a damn, and the majority of mothers fall somewhere in the between. Look at these rats, for example. As a result, all you have to do is keep tabs on them and split them into cages. Because the high lickers are not the mothers but the offspring and the low lickers are in a separate cage, you can see that the high lickers have a lot of glucocorticoid receptor gene expression in their brains, but this isn't the only difference. As time went on, we discovered that hundreds of genes had variable levels of expression. So, if a mutation occurs, you'll be aware of polymorphism, which occurs around once in a million. With just a single injection from the mother, hundreds of genes are launched, and the modifications they produce are so consistent that you can examine an elderly rat and tell whether it was licked or not. But you may also save money by changing your habits. You can tell which rats were badly lighted by looking at their behavior, the frightened, difficult to maneuver ones act like puppies, while the well-managed ones act like kittens. They have a lot more laid-back disposition, which makes them much simpler to manage. When a rat is being licked by an adult, it's important to look at how it was licked when it was a bit tough. Mechanism. What's going on here, and how does it all work? Now, you might think it's strange that in a lecture on biology, I will be talking a lot about mathematics. If I may digress a bit. When I was a student, mathematics, the language of clear abstraction, had nothing to do with life sciences like biology, the sphere of messy organic forms, cutting up frogs in the lab, and so on, um. In fact, I started doing biology precisely to avoid math and physics. So, I've had a lot of catching up to do.
We are all aware of how the sciences have come to interrelate more and more, and not only will mathematics impinge more and more on biology but also, I am told, in the 21st century, the driving force behind mathematics will be biology. This is partly because mathematicians are always on the lookout for more areas to conquer. But a far greater reason is that the subject has been boiled down to physics and chemistry, obvious attractions for mathematicians. A number of mathematical fields can be applied to biology. For example, knot theory is used in the analysis of the tangled strands of DNA, and abstract geometry in four or more dimensions is used to tell us about viruses. Again, neuroscience appears to be maths friendly and equations can also explain why hallucinogenic drugs cause the users to see spirals. So, if mathematicians are taking such a keen interest in biology, the least we can do as biologists is return the compliment. Now, you might think it's strange that in a lecture on biology, I will be talking a lot about mathematics. If I may digress a bit. When I was a student, mathematics, the language of clear abstraction, had nothing to do with life sciences like biology, the sphere of messy organic forms, cutting up frogs in the lab, and so on, um. In fact, I started doing biology precisely to avoid math and physics. So, I've had a lot of catching up to do. We are all aware of how the sciences have come to interrelate more and more, and not only will mathematics impinge more and more on biology but also, I am told, in the 21st century, the driving force behind mathematics will be biology. This is partly because mathematicians are always on the lookout for more areas to conquer. But a far greater reason is that the subject has been boiled down to physics and chemistry, obvious attractions for mathematicians. A number of mathematical fields can be applied to biology. For example, knot theory is used in the analysis of the tangled strands of DNA, and abstract geometry in four or more dimensions is used to tell us about viruses. Again, neuroscience appears to be maths friendly and equations can also explain why hallucinogenic drugs cause the users to see spirals. So, if mathematicians are taking such a keen interest in biology, the least we can do as biologists is return the compliment. <laughs> 